And uh, in this session, we will continue with Fernando Brandao and his course on quantum thermodynamics. Thank you. Uh, so, welcome everyone. Thanks for staying to the last lecture today. Uh, so, let's start from where we stopped last time. Uh, but before carry on, maybe you, you don't remember what we did last time. Maybe you were not here. I also forget a few things. Uh, so let's just rev revise what we did yesterday, but instead of an hour and a half in 10 minutes. So, but we can do it because I don't have to write anymore. I can go really fast. Uh, so what, what, what was the starting point yesterday? Was to try to formulate uh, a version of thermodynamics in, st in terms of what we call uh, resource theory, right? Uh, and then first we just start revising, you know, why, why information theory might be uh, a good language to talk about thermodynamics. And, and then first I try to convince you that maybe it's not a good language, right? Because these two theories, they have very different goals and objects and so on, right? So thermodynamics, heat engines, refrigerators, information theory is about communication channels, memories. One you have crude control, in the other one you have full control. One, the concepts that matter are like work, heat, free energy, and the other one's like capacities, optimum rates. But what connects the two, at least in principle, is entropy, right? And, and therefore, we want to understand if entropy is just a choice of word or if it's really something fundamental in both of them. And in one sense, this is what statistical mechanics is about, is to connect these two notions of entropies. But here we consider a different uh, perspective, right? And we look whether Actually, the absence of entropy, like neg entropy, can be related to information in the way that we think about it in information theory. And then we saw that one way, like maybe the first or one of the first ways uh, that people make sense of this idea was in was Zillard in, in his Inchin, which is this thought experiment, right, where we imagine that, where you try to argue that having one bit of information, namely here whether the particle is on the left or on the right, is enough to draw one bit of work, right? And we did some, some easy calculation. I'm not going to repeat. And we get that you know, one bit of information corresponds to KT LN2 of work. Uh, and if you do this process in, in reverse, you have this Landauer's principle, which means that uh, you can, you know, if you want to reset one bit of information, now you have to invest KT LN2 of work. And then this was uh, motivation for trying to generalize it, right? So the question, was whether uh, given a quantum state row, we can, how much work we can draw from it. And this is a question that we are going to, uh, to focus in this lecture. Uh, then what we mean by states, this was a dense matrix, right? So just a mixed quantum state. And because of this Zillard engine, we could reduce the problem to the problem of given a, a quantum state row to distill uh, purity out of it, to distill pure, pure quantum states out of it, right? And by using some class of operations that we are going to see what they are next. Because then if you can distill purity, then we just use like uh, the Zillard engine and then we extract work from it. So the problem reduces to how much purity we can get from a quantum state row, right? So that's, that was the first problem. Uh, and then, okay, but then we, you know, we put on hold this problem for a little bit and we, we discuss more generally what these resource theories are, right? Uh, and then as we saw, this is like a, a general framework for, uh, for like um, understanding uh, physical processes when you have a constraint on the, ca on, the, on the type of physical operations that you have, right? And this, this of course, is very broad, but we, we look at some examples. So, so the fundamental ideas of resource theories are, are a class of operations, uh, free states, resources, and then we want to send the rate of conversion for going from one quantum state to another. And we saw three examples, entanglement theory, that we, we looked at it in detail last time. This theory of purity is what we are going to, to do now. This reference frame was something that I just mentioned in passing, we won't see. And finally, what we also do in this lecture is thermodynamics, right? How to express thermodynamics in this language. Then we look at entanglement theory, right? So um, this I, I won't revise, but what matters is that what we see now is that there are many questions we can ask. One is, like asymptotic transformations. We have many copies of a state. We want to go to many copies of another state. We will see a similar question today, like for purity of in thermodynamics. And then the answer for this question is in terms of entropies, of von Neumann entropies. And this will happen again today. 
then we also look at single copy transformations, right? And, and the idea and the, uh, the result was that in this case, the answer is in terms of this notion uh, between probability distributions that we, we call majorization, which is a measure of, of entropy in the, of actually of mixedness, mix, mixedness in the distribution, which is more refined than entropy. Uh, and then we saw this, that you know, you, you can have this phenomenon of catalyst, right? That would be important here too. Uh, and that the answer in terms of catalytic single copy transformations is again, it's kind of elegant, right? It's in terms of entropy again, but not the entropies, these ones, they are these Rennie entropies, right? So it's a generalization of phenomenal entropy. This is the expression. And uh, when, as we saw, when alpha goes to one, this becomes the Neumann entropy or the channel entropy if it's a probability distribution, uh, but it's, you know, they, it's, it's richer. There are different alphas. So this was entanglement theory. That is not the focus of this talk, but we see there is a lot of similarities to what we are going to talk now. Uh, so now what we are going to talk about is this resource theory of purity, right? We just started discussing this last time. And so we want to describe this as a, as a resource theory, and for that we have to first specify what's the class of physical operations that we want to consider, right? Uh, so we want to we want a theory where, where resource is to have purity, is to have pure quantum states. Um, so, uh, so so in this case, the class of free states, which uh, they will be just maximally mixed states. Okay, these are states that have no purity on it on them, right? So they make sense to take them as free resources. We want to now make uh, we want to uh, have access to operations that cannot create like purity for free. And these are unitaries, right? So, if you apply unitary, you always preserve the the uh, you know the entropy of the states, the eigenvalues of the states, and therefore any entropy you want. And of course, you want to be able to throw away things out. So we we are we have access to like a trash we can trace out. Uh, now here, because um, because we care about purity, right? It's we cannot, for example, apply some isometry to the state. We cannot. Uh, we cannot increase the dimension of the space because this is like introducing uh, a pure state into the system. So here we have to remember what's the dimension of the space, like here's a dimensional space, and we have to stick to it. Okay? It's not like entanglement theory where we can change the dimension. So it'd be some like toy, toy model, right? So, uh, but this would be very useful once we go to thermodynamics where we will combine this with some other constraint that comes from thermodynamics, namely uh, conservation of energy, and we see what we get. So this is what we did. Uh, before I continue, is there, is there any question from yesterday? Did you try to, yeah, yes. Uh-huh. Well, uh, so it, yeah, it's a generalization in the sense that the Shannon entropy is is when alpha equals zero, so it's a particular case of it, right? Uh, also, it's, it has some similar properties, but not, not all properties as the Shannon entropy. For example, it's, it's additive as the Shannon entropy is, um, but it's not, uh, it's not sub-additive as the Shannon entropy is. Uh, and, but the, the reason why they're interesting is because they, they appear as rates in, in, in some problems, one of them we saw, and there are other concepts, other contexts where they appear as well. So uh, it's not like something arbitrary, something that appears naturally, right? So, uh, but they have some nice properties, like if you wanna, um, I forgot the result. So it's like, it's a uniqueness result. If you want some, some measure of entropy and then you have to put some postulates and I forgot what they are unfortunately, but the important one is additivity and some others which are natural ones, then you can prove that the only functions that satisfy them are Rennie entropies. But I forgot the rest, the other postulates. So right? I can check later. Uh, okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's continue, right? So we want to do like uh, like we did uh, yesterday. So we we will be interested in two kinds of questions. Uh, one question, of course, is, is how much purity uh, can be extracted from from a, a given state, right, in, in this dimensional Hilbert space. Um, this is a particular case of the, of, uh, 
of a more general question, right, that we also study, which is this uh, state transformation question, right? So we want to understand when, uh, when can we transform rho into sigma by these noisy operations, right, that we just introduced, that I just introduced last time, these ones here, right? And they're noisy operations because, right, you only have access, you can bring ancillas to the system, but the ancillas, they have to be maxly mixed, right? You don't have access to any source of purity. Uh, so this is what we want to do. Uh, now, last time we saw entropy, right, and introduced what entropy is, and, and I guess most of you knew. Now we need some, uh, some other notion of, of entropy, which is extremely useful in, in thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, also in information theory which we call uh, relative entropy. S and this is a measure of distinguishability between two quantum states. So what's the definition? We have a relative entropy of a state rho and a state tau. It's equal to trace rho uh, log rho minus log tau. Right, so, in, so trace rho log rho is minus entropy, and then to that you, you add minus trace rho log tau, okay? Uh, and there is a, no, there's a, there's a lot that we could talk about it, right? So, uh, for example, it's always big or equal to zero. Um, Actually, it can diverge, so the only upper bound that we have uh, is infinity. It can go to infinity. Um, and uh, so why, I, I, I don't have time, time, time to explain much about it, but uh, this is very useful in, uh, in information theory because it's, it's connected to what we call hypothesis testing. So just maybe quickly, suppose that uh, they have a problem where you have, you have like a black box and it outputs either some number of copies of rho or some number of copies of tau, okay? Uh, you don't know which one, but you know it's either one of, or the other. And then you wanna find out which one it is, right? So what you can do, well, you can make measurements, right? So, so you can apply a POVM, a two element POVM right, to the system, and then if you measure the outcome associated to AN, you say that you have rho, this is like having rho. The outcome associated to this, to identity minus AN to the complement, you say you have tau. And then, uh, you know, you, you, wanna, you, wanna, you wanna find out the best P of M that does the distinguishability, right? And then of course, when the number of copies increase, rho and tau, because they are different, they become more and more orthogonal, more and more distinguishable, right? And you, you can do a better job. Uh, it turns out that you can distinguish them exponentially well with the number of copies, and the relative entropy will be exactly the rates of distinguishability. So like uh, you require, for example, that suppose you require the probability that you make a, a mistake, for example, you measure AN uh, when you actually have, uh, uh, when you actually have a tau, so, uh, you suppose you, so this is the probability that when you have rho, you measure an, which is the outcome associated to an, let's call zero, which is the right one. So suppose you require that this goes to one. This means that whenever you have rho, you get the right outcome in the limits, right? And, and the answer is correct. Now, if you just, uh, some result, which is called quantum Stein's lemma. Uh, Stein's lemma. It tells you that there exists like a sequence of POVMs such that this is the case. So the probabilities of, of error, we call like type one error. That's we you know that, that we think that we have tau when we actually have rho, this goes to zero. So this expectation value goes to one. And at the same time, trace an and, uh, sorry, this is an acts on n copies, right? So this is when the number of copies increase. And then if you apply that to n copies of tau, then actually you can show that there exists this sequence for which this decreases exponentially, right? As you, you expect some like large deviation bounds. Uh, and this will be like smaller than two to the minus n 
times the relative entropy. Okay. So this is like the interpretation of this of this quantity, right? It tells you how this how how well you can distinguish these two quantum states if you have access to many copies of them. Uh, so this is like the interpretation from information theory, but you see that this also has an interpretation quantum in, in thermodynamics, right? And it will appear as, as the optimal rates in this problem here. Okay, so that's just an aside, just why it appears in information theory. So now, um, so now one, uh, one claim is that this, this function, suppose we have this function rho, and now this relative entropy of rho and tau, where tau now, uh, throughout the rest of the talk, I will always denote the maximum mixed state, okay? So it will be just the state where all the eigenvalues are the same. So, um, it's the diagonal state of that. Um, and well, one exercise that you, you can you can compute is very simple. Is that this because tau is maximum mix, the relative entropy is equal to log d minus the entropy of rho. So in this case, it's very simple, right? It's just some function of the entropy. So you can think, right? Because we have the uh, the negative of the entropy here, this is like you can think of some notion of, of neg entropy, right? Of order here now, right? So uh, if rho is maximum mixed, right? So if rho equals tau, then this guy it's easy to see that it's equal to zero, right? Uh, and if rho is a pure state, then this relative entropy, maybe here I call it rho, is equal to the maximum value, which is just log d, right? Okay, so it's like a measure of, of negative entropy, of order. Uh, okay, so now, uh, right, so, this, I didn't do any claim, right? But now the claim is that uh, this function, S of rho and tau, is what we call a monotone, is a monotone with respect uh, to thermal operations, okay? In the sense that uh, this function can only go down if we apply a thermal operation to the state, okay? So in other words, suppose that uh, we map rho. Sorry. Oh yeah, I I jumped one hour. Noisy operations. Uh, so so what's the idea? Suppose that we have a, a mapping between the map. No, we have a we map rho to lambda rho, where lambda is a channel, where lambda you know it's a noisy operation, right? It's a concatenation of these three, three operations that we saw. Then the entropy, the relative entropy of of lambda rho, tau is always smaller uh, than the relative entropy of rho and tau. Okay, uh, and of course, then this is useful, right? It's always good to have monotons. Uh, for example, we can use monotons to bound rate of conversions, right? As you see. Uh, so why that's the case? Well, this follows from basic properties of relative entropy. Uh, then it follows from one basic property is very useful that it's called uh, monotonicity or, no to, uh, or actually monotonicity one name but uh, better name is this data processing inequality. So this is a fundamental property of relative entropy is equivalent to another inequality we call strong subadditivity if you heard of it. And it just says that uh, if you have relative entropy of two quantum states, that's always bigger or equal than the relative entropy of the two quantum states if you apply a quantum channel to them, okay? This is for all states rho and sigma and channel lambda. And that makes sense, right? Because if you are apply a channel to these two states, they become le less distinguishable, right? So uh, S of rho and sigma is a measure of distinguishability, so it should go down, right? So it's what we expect. Uh, intuitively, and it's true. So then now it's very easy to prove this equation, right? Uh, and why, why it's easy to prove it? Because we just have to realize that if lambda is a noisy operation, then lambda applied to the maximum mixed state is equal to the maximum mixed state again, right? 
Um, everyone sees why this is the case? It's, it's very easy, right? So you, w what is this noise operation? Uh, you trace out something in the end, like let's call E the system you trace out. Uh, you apply some unitary, right? You have the original states, maybe you call this pi first. You have the original states, and you can attach some other maximum mixed state to the system, right? So you can attach tau, and as many copies of tau as you want, okay. So this is the channel, right? But now if, if pi equals tau, what you're doing is just you're taking a, a very big maximum mixed state, you're applying a unitary to it, which doesn't change anything, it's still maximum mixed, and you're tracing out some of the copies of it, right? So this is again maximum mixed, right? So uh, lambda tau equals tau. Okay. Um, and then, and then, right? So we get this equation, right? Because uh, s rho tau is always bigger than s lambda rho lambda tau, but lambda tau equals tau again, right? Okay, so that's it's a monotone. Uh, do, you, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, all right. So monotones are always useful because, as I said, they can uh, bound the rate of conversion. But this is particularly useful uh, in the sense that this is the only monotone that matters here in one particular setting. So, um, so let me tell you some results. This is by this paper that I mentioned before, Horodek Oppenheim. Uh, what it says is that we can go from rho to sigma by noise operations asymptotically, right? And maybe I, I will remind you what I mean by this. It's the same thing as entanglement, but I, I write it. But it's a complete criterion. So we can do that if and only if this relative entropy of rho and tau uh, is bigger than the relative entropy of sigma and tau. So again, it's, a, it's like a complete order, right? You have some reversibility. All you have to care about is this function, how this distinguishable your state rho is from the maximum mixed state, and this will tell you what, uh, if you can make the conversion or not. So uh, S less time, what this notation means, right? This means that um, if you take the limit, and goes to infinity. You minimize over all noisy operations now. Uh, you look at the, how distinguishable, like in trace norm, uh, lambda n copies of rho is from uh, like n copies of sigma. You don't mind losing a little bit, uh, you know, a few copies as long as it's sublinear. This O of n is some sublinear factor. And then uh, we want that this is equal to zero, right? So the error goes to zero. So this is what we mean. Uh, and then the criteria is just look at this relative entropy, as before. Uh, and uh, the idea uh, how, to, how to prove this result is quite simple. I, I would just sketch, but it's, it's nice because it's related to information theory. It's just, uh, it's just to use compression uh, of quantum states, but uh, in, whereas in compression, of course, we want to compress the information to, to a smaller Hilbert space and keep the information there. Here you make the compression, but we forget about where the information is and we look at the garbage, okay? And the garbage, there'll be some purity there and this is good for us. And the rate will be exactly what we want. So the idea is that we look at compression, uh, but in a sense in, in, uh, you know, in, in the reverse direction that you do, right? So what's the idea of compression? Is that we have a quantum source that produces many copies of a quantum state. Then, I won't prove it, but maybe some of you already saw this and, and this is a true fact. You can find some some unitary such that this unitary, if you apply to the state, is approximately, and the quality of the approximation gets better and better when n grows, to some some states, a uh, row n um, tensor some number of copies of zero, uh, and the point is that let me call this like m copies of zero. And the point is that uh, the rank of these states, right, where all the information is, uh, it's, it's much smaller than the original one, actually it's only dependent on the entropy of the source and not on the original Hilbert space dimension. So this rank is roughly uh, exponential in the entropy, right, n times entropy of rho, okay? 
But now we can do some accounting, right? So what was the dimension on the left-hand side? The dimension on the left-hand side is, uh, is d to the power of n, right? So, but of course the dimension have to match on both sides because you just apply some unitary. So d to the power of n is the original dimension of rho, n copies of rho. This has to be roughly uh, the dimension of rho n, which is two to the n times entropy of rho, times, uh, uh, times the, we made, so what I, what I said here is that what I, what I have in mind when I write zero is that the zero is one of the states of a two level system, right? So you should see this as one of the bases of a two level system, zero and one. So this is equal to two to the M again, okay? Uh, so we take logs and find that N log D equals N entropy of rho plus M. And then we find that as we expect, right, this M is enough to take it equal to uh, N times log D minus entropy of rho. And this is N times relative entropy of rho and tau, okay? Which is what we want to show, right? Um, so, well, what this shows, this shows that uh, we can go from rho by noisy operations. Actually, right, this is just like, you know, we just apply a, a unitary and we trace out. So it's a noisy operation, it's a very simple noisy operation, asymptotically, uh, to zero, to the zero state, uh, but to the zero to the power uh, of uh, relative entropy of rho and tau. And you know, this doesn't have to be an integer because in asymptotically is, right, is implicit that we take many copies on both sides, right? So, so we can write this kind of equations where you know, uh, we just have the relative entropy here. But, um, but I also claim that the, the reverse process is, is true. You can start with this number of copies of the zero states and map it by noise operations asymptotically to rho. Uh, and th why that's the case? Well, because basically you can do the, the process that we did here in, in this, that I just showed you here, this process, we can do it in reverse. And the only thing that you have to, to notice is that in compression, once we, we go to, to this compress information here, rho of n, it's pretty much maximally mixed there. So instead of having this rho of n, we can just put a state which is maximally mixed in that subspace that's allowed. We just apply the unitary in the reverse direction and we get the original copies of this state. Okay, so it's the same thing again. So it's basically just compression. We also have this relation here. Uh, and if you have this relation, we have reversibility, right? Because we can go from rho to a pure state back and forth without losing anything, just change the number of copies. So it means that we can convert any state in, into any other, as we saw for entanglement, entrop entanglement theory, right? So it's, it's the same thing here again. Um, so that's, that's the asymptotic theory, right? It's extremely simple. You see it's just uh, compression of information. Uh, any, any question about this? Okay. Uh, so what happens for, uh, for single shot now? And we see that for single shot, it will be again very similar to entanglement. Will be just majorization will appear. So we want to do now a single copy actually, single copy uh, transformations. So we use this notation, right, that we can do by noise operations from rho to sigma, uh, which means, right, so this means, maybe I write, this means that there exists lambda which is a noise operation such that uh, sigma equals to lambda rho. Uh, and again, we have something very similar to entanglement theory, we, but here the proof is, is actually simpler and we just see it. So when we can do this conversion from one to the other, well, if and only if uh, rho majorizes sigma. Okay. So, uh, right, if you remember that there was like the similar kind of things that we had for pure state and thermal transformation. Um, so let's let's see how this is done, right? It will be very uh, simple, but right. So to prove that, we need some, maybe some, let's call it a lemma, but it's very, it's more of like just a claim. So, and, and this is just that uh, a channel 
which we define as a convex combination of, of unitaries, right? So P of I is a, is a convex, is a, is a probability distribution. You have U of I, which is a unitary, U of I dagger. For any choice of PI and UI, the, the, the lemma say that this is a noisy operation, okay? That you can always do mixing of unitaries by noisy operations, right? Uh, so physically, that's very, that's very intuitive, right? Because in noisy operations, you have access to randomness. You have access to the maximum mix state. That's like perfect randomness. You have access to unitaries. So if you combine the two, of course, you, you should be able to do, um, to do any convex combination of unitaries you want, right? Uh, so, so more formally why that's the case, we can do any unitary that we want. So suppose we do this, uh, a controlled unitary of this form. Uh, N, and then there's some control register which is in the I states. It's like orthogonal, orthogonal basis. And then condition on being the I states, you apply some, uh, maybe let's call this J. You apply some unitary uh, U of J. Now, let's just see what's the action of U when we have uh, a max limbic state that, that we can get for free, right, in, in the control register, and we have a state uh, row in the other one. Then, right, we just do the computation. This is equal to 1 over N, some I from 1 to N, uh, UJ, row UJ, right? So this, this just shows that at least if, if this probability distribution is maxly mixed, then it's, it's easy to do it, right? We just do like some controlled unitary uh, condition uh, and put the maximum mix there in the control register. But then uh, this PI can be, can be, you know, other thing. It doesn't have to be maximum mixed. How we do in this case? Well, it's easy how to, how to do, uh, how to do for uh, probability distributions for which the PIs, the PIs, they are all ra rational, right? How we do in this case, we just, you just like choose some of this U of J to be the same, right? So for some, some of these J values, we choose the same unitary, right? And then in this, end, in this way, we can create any distribution for which the PIs are rational. But of course, this N, this capital N is as big as we want because this maximum mixed state can be as big as we want. So we can, you know, we, uh, we can only create like this rational probability distributions, but any probability distribution can be approximately arbitrary well by them. So we just take the limit of them and we, you know, we allow these limits to be a noisy operation as well. So that, that's how we do it. Um, okay, so now how, how this gets us closer to this, to this result, right? This, this is also, let's call it a uh, theorem. This is also, uh, that we're going to show now. Well, this follows from some uh, important result about majorization, which is used, uh, it's also used like in this proof of entanglement theory that I show you, but we are going to use it now, which is called uh, Bikoff von Neumann uh, theorem. And what it says is that a probability distribution P majorize another one P prime if and only if there exists a channel lambda such that the channel maps one distribution to the other, and the channel preserves the maximum mixed distribution. Okay, so it's like a bistochastic channel. This is like for, it's classical for its probability distributions now. So tau is the maximum mixed probability distribution, it's mapped to tau again, okay? So in other words, it's a bistochastic map. Is Um, oops. Right. So now, uh, so now, why this is useful for us? Well, this is uh, this is useful for us because actually, uh, not in general in the quantum case, but classically, uh, by stochastic map is always uh, a convex combination. of permutations. Right, so permutation, of course, is a bistochastic map. It maps, it preserves, it's just like some very simple unitary, right? So it just permutes like the, the basis vector. So it maps maximum mixed to maximum mixed. But actually any bistochastic map, you can write as a convex combination of uh, permutations. But a but convex combination of permutations is just a noisy operation, right? We just saw, right? It's just a noisy operation by this lemma here, this one here. So combining things, we get the result, right? So we know that, uh, 
if rho if you know if rho is major, majorizes sigma, then first we only care about the eigenvalues because we can rotate the states the way we want. So it's really a statement about uh, two quantum states they are in the same basis. So it's about probability distributions. Then, because they majorize each other, it means that there exists this channel, right? This channel here that maps one to the other, which is what we want. Uh, and this channel is a bistochastic map. So, it's a bistochastic map. It means that uh, it's a complex combination of permutations, which means that it's a noisy operation. So, we have one direction. The other direction is easy. I, I, I don't want. I won't show you now. But it's just that if you can map rho to sigma by, uh, oh, actually, uh, is equally easy. So, if you can map rho to sigma by a noisy operation. Uh, then, uh, then you know. So you can you can map it by uh, any noise operation is a bistochastic map as well, and therefore uh, majorization has to be preserved, right? By this again, because of Neumann theorem. I, you have questions on this? Okay. I, yes. Yes. Uh, it's not. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, amplitude damping. Well, if you apply locally, yes, right? Because amplitude damping is like a one qubit channel, right? So, but of course, you could apply just. Yes. No. So, because uh, like LCC is, uh, you, you define LCC at least on, on a bipartite. Hilbert space, right? You have to have Alice and Bob, right? Noise operations can be on a single, uh, on, on one part space, right? You don't have to have like many, many parts, right? Uh, it's more that just the, uh, um, yeah. The, the, the connection is more subtle, right? It's, uh, but it's a good question. I, and I don't know how to answer this. It's like, it's a, for me, at least it's a conceptual open question. How you see that these two theories, they are very similar in terms of the answers that you get. But I don't know how to connect them in an operational way, right? It would be very nice that whenever you have a protocol in one, you convert the protocol in the other, and that would explain more why you have this, all these results. You kind of can do that, but it's not, not in a satisfying way. So I, I would like to get a, a, I would like to know a better relation, like operational between LCC and this purity theory, for example. But it's, I don't have it. Okay, so let me see where we are. Right, so the last thing before we go to final, finally thermodynamics, right, that I want to talk about this, this toy theory is what happens to catalytic uh, transformations. Uh, and again here, right, we have something similar to what we saw last time. By the same reasons, right, because we, we just saw that the single shot, the single copy criterion is majorization, right? So now catalytic majorization, or sorry, catalytic transformations, what we mean, right, is just that there exists some state pi such that rho and pi can be mapped by noise operations to sigma and pi. And we just saw that this is equivalent to rho pi majorizing, right, uh, sigma and pi. But we, we understood what's the criterion of this catalytic uh, majorization, right? This is called like this trumping from last time. And this will get the Rennie entropies, right? So here again, we get the, Ren the Rennie entropies. So we will get a row we can map to by noise operations, catalytic. Oops. Um, Sigma, if and only if, all these functions, they are monotonous, right? If the entropies go up, right, so is what we expect. But now, it's all rainy entropies, okay? Um, right, so, so this, uh, as I was saying last time, this is uh, like, in a sense, a theory where the only uh, resource that, or the the only thing that we care about is is negative entropy, right? The only the only uh, valuable resource is purity, so it's really a theory only about entropies. Uh, and of course, we know that entropy is a is a big part of thermodynamics, right? But it's not the only one, right? Thermodynamics is about entropy and it's about energy, right? So now we finally get to the point how how we can define this resource theory of <coughs> sorry of thermodynamics, 
And for that, we have to see how we can put energy into this framework that we just developed for this purity, right? So, yes. Oh, that, that's right, yes, right, so, so indeed. So here, right, is, is what we expect, right? So if you can map rho to sigma, the entropy of sigma, they all, all these random entropies, they will be bigger than the entropy of, of rho. And this is the opposite of what we had in entanglement theory, right? In entanglement theory, the, the more entanglement you have, the bigger the local entropies, right? And therefore, you know, you can, we can only go to, uh, to a state which has, uh, if you go from rho to sigma, the local entropy of, or, or from psi to, to, to phi, the local entropy of psi has to be bigger than the local entropies of phi, right? So, so indeed, and, and maybe that's, yeah, that helps to explain why, uh, why to find like operational uh, conversion between these two theories is, uh, is not such an easy problem, right? it's, not, it's not straightforward. Um, of course, if you look at the protocols, you see the protocols are very similar, right? But I don't wanna work with protocols. I like to say, okay, whatever protocol you have in one, you can convert into a protocol to the other, right? Blindly, this I, I don't know how to do it to make sense, in a way that makes sense. Okay, good. So now, finally, you rise. Let's go to... Resource theory for... Thermodynamics. So as I said, right, so now what we want to do is to find a resource theory for for two resources, different resources. One is entropy, or negative entropy, and the other is energy, right? So before everything that we looked was like a resource theory for one resource, like entanglement or only purity. Now we want to have something for two resources at the same time, right? And uh, and this energy, this I I won't mention, but a resource theory for just energy would be uh, would be example of this resource theories of reference frames, right? So. So like a uh, resource theory where energy is conserved, this is like a conservation law, right? So, um, so you can develop it, but it will be something that uh, people are studying these reference frame theories. But uh, I would just explain how it works in, in the case of thermodynamics, okay? Um, so I'm time, okay. Good, so, so what would be the set, setup here? The setup is that we have a system, and you have some bath or some uh, or some uh, reservoir, right? Uh, and we imagine that this this bath is very big; is at some fixed temperature t, okay? And we'll be interested. There are like several setups in thermodynamics, but here we'll be interested in what we call like uh, isothermal processes. Right, which is when uh, the system, the bath, they can change energy, they can change particles and so on, but the temperature is fixed, okay? The temperature cannot be changed. So for example, the system can, can, can uh, get part of the heat bath if it wants, but this heat bath will always be at some fixed temperature. So now how, okay, how we abstract this into like this more like resource theory uh, language? we have to define some class of operations, right? And this would be what we call this uh, thermal operations. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, did you try to do the exercise last time? No? Okay. Um, I'm disappointed, but it's good that you didn't try because I, you know, I was too slow, so in the end of this lecture, you'll be able to do the exercise for the first lecture. Uh, and, and then you shouldn't try to do the exercise of this uh, of this lecture this time because I, you know, you 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 haven't seen the material yet. So so in the end we have just two exercises. Okay. So so the first the first one is for the first two lectures and the second is for the last lecture, and and the third one you you don't have to do it, but you can do it if you want. But the, we we won't cover it. Um, okay. So ah so before we go to the to this from operations. Uh, so we have like this isothermal processes, right? So, uh, and of course, we, now we want to understand uh, state transformation in thermodynamics, right? When we can go from, 
from uh, one thermodynamic state to another, or when we can extract work from a state by isothermal processes, and and we know what's the right uh, what's the right quantity here, right? So because temperature is fixed, we know that the right quantity is the free energy. Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, you could consider other situations. You could consider adiabatic process, for example, and and this and and then th this you have other resource theories, but I won't focus. I won't cover them. Right, it's true. So I uh, right. This is not a resource theory for thermodynamics. It's for uh, a specific uh, case in thermodynamics, which is isothermal process when you have a bath and you can, and the temperature is fixed. You don't change the temperature. Uh, and it, it's it's a good question how to do to get something more general, but uh, we don't know yet how to do it. So what's the free energy? And you see it will also play a role here, right? The free energy is some temperature rho, uh, temperature T of a state rho is what? Is the mean energy minus temperature and entropy, right? So the mean energy is just the expectation value on the Hamiltonian of the system, right? So finally we have some Hamiltonians because we have energy now of the system times temperature and entropy of the state, okay? So this is what we learn, right, when we study thermodynamics and, and we see how to, you know, how to derive that this is the right notion uh, in, in this framework that we're going to describe now. So what are these thermal operations? So it consists of, of two, uh, three different things that you can do. One is, um, okay, maybe some, some more notation first. Uh, we is the Hamiltonian of the system. So so you'll be able to do three operations. One is uh, we try to model what is this interaction with the heat path, right? So you just, how you do this interaction? Well, usually you just, you know, you, you have access to part of the heat path, uh, and we're going to model this as adding to the system, uh, like part of the state of the, of the heat path, and we think about that as adding Gibbs states, okay? So we're allowed to add any Gibbs states. And what's a Gibbs state? Well, it's just, uh, has this form, right? So it's, has some Hamiltonian, like the Hamiltonian of the reservoir or of the bath over T, and Z is the partition function, right? Um, so, well, okay, maybe you haven't seen the Gibbs state yet, so, so, so this is this quantum state. What it means by that, we have a Hamiltonian, HR, and we won't care what the Hamiltonian of the reservoir is, okay? It can be, it can be anything you want, but, uh, It will be like the results that we get will be independent of it. Okay, so it will be like universal in this, in these Hamiltonians. Um, so what what is this state, right? Suppose we have a Hamiltonian. It's a Hamiltonian operator, right? So we can write in the eigenbasis. These are the energies, and these are the eigenvectors. Then the Gibbs states, right? Uh, and I would denote this again by by tau, but now tau hr is the Gibbs state of this Hamiltonian. This is equal to the state which is diagonal in the eigenbase of the Hamiltonian with the Boltzmann weights, right? So e to the minus uh, ek over t with the same eigenbases. Okay. So so why we use this state? Well. We, and we t this will be the talk of the last lecture, actually, but, uh, which is like more in the foundations of statistical mechanics. But this is the state that we expect whenever we have a system in equilibrium, right? So we have a big bath, it's at thermal equilibrium, so the state should be, you know, a Gibbs state. Uh, so, okay, this is, right, so this, this is analog to what we did before when we were adding maximally mixed states, right? So in a sense, you can think the theory that we did before was when we we are adding some Gibbs states at uh, either at uh, infinite temperature, right? If T goes to infinity, all this, uh, of course, this is not normalized, right? So we have to normalize this. So we divide by right now is a quantum state. Let me 
didn't work. Um, okay, so if temperature goes to infinity, what happens, right? If the temperature goes to infinity in these states, it goes to the maximum mixed state, right? All the eigenvalues become the same. So you can think that uh, this operation that we were doing before in this, uh, like this thermodynamics dynamics for kids, was to to add Gibbs states, uh, like at infinite temperature, if you want, or or we had a Hamiltonian which was degenerate, right? For which all the energy levels were the same, right? And if all the energy levels are the same, then uh, the Gibbs state is just right uh, the maximum mixed state. So that's that's a, that's the sense in which the theory that we saw before uh, will be like a toy model of what we are going to see now. Okay. So, uh, so then what's the second thing that we can do? What, uh, before we could do any unitary, right? But now we have to apply unitaries, but they have to conserve energy, right? We cannot uh, apply any operation that we want. So we, we assume that we can perform uh, unitary U such that, uh, and this unitary acts on, uh, on the system and, 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 the, and the path, right? But this unitary has to commute with the total Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian of the system plus the Hamiltonian of the the reservoir. So this has to be equal to zero, okay? So that's the way that we are going to impose the first law here, right? Energy conservation. So en energy conservation is inbuilt in this in this formalism, right? So it's one of like the postulates. We can apply any unitary you want, but it has to preserve energy. And finally, as before, we can trace out. Okay, so really, what we saw before is just a special case where this HR, right? So let's write this uh, before, like this um, purity theory. It's just a special case where HR is always is always equals to zero, okay, or equals to identity. Actually, maybe it's better. It's equal to the Identity is like, oh, it's completely degenerate, the energy levels. And then if that's the case, right, the first, uh, well, HR is identity and also H system is identity, okay? So all the Hamiltonians are trivial. If the Hamiltonians are trivial, then the state you can add is a Gibbs state, is the maximum mixed state. Um, and, the, and the unitary, right, doesn't have to compute with anything because it's just identity. So you can apply any unitary you want, yes. So we uh, we assume that uh, that there isn't interaction. So you you can uh, you can put interaction, but then uh, okay, the, the, if the interaction is very weak, if you just assume some weak coupling between the two, you, this results will be the, will be the same. But the, let's in this lecture we just assume that there is no interaction. It would be simpler to uh, to describe. So uh, no, yeah. The f when, you, when you take this Gibbs state from the environment, is in a product with the state that you had before. Yes. Any other question? Yes. Oh, the, the, there is some interaction, which is this unitary that you can apply, right? This unitary couples the two, but it, it has to compute with the total Hamiltonian, right? So uh, indeed, so actually, yes, so uh, this, and okay, I won't cover that, but I'll give a reference later, which is a, a paper where this paradigm you can show, which is equivalent to exactly that. So where you have a time independent Hamiltonian, which now couples the system and the path, uh, and you just, you know, let, let it run for, for some time, okay? So there is, this is like a, this is like more, more quantum information way of, of modeling this, right, this, the, this physical scenario. Um, okay. So now, what what we want to one question that we want to answer is whether we can uh, recover uh, standard from dynamics, right, uh, in this paradigm, or maybe I should say standard uh, from dynamics results, right? Of course, you know, it's a, it's a different setup, right? Uh, and I think that's an interesting question because, because in a sense we are, uh, you can think that we are allowing too much here, right? So as I said in, in, the, in the first lecture, thermodynamics is about having just like this, this crude control over, over the system, right? 
And here we are allowing a very fine-tuned control over the system, right? So we are allowing like any unitary as long as it, it preserves energy, right? So maybe, you know, having full control of the system is a problem. Full control energy levels. This might be a problem because, right, this is not what traditional thermodynamics uh, is built on. Also here, right, we, as I said, we are allowing like these arbitrary heat paths. Of course, in nature, the heat paths, they are, right, they have a very special forms. Uh, and maybe that's, again, giving too much power and we might not recover what we expect from thermodynamics. Um, but the lesson would be that even, you know, uh, giving all this power, uh, we will get the same answer as thermodynamics, at least like in the thermodynamic limits when you have a lot of number of a large number of copies of the state. Okay, so uh, I, one way that I I see this result is as saying that uh, thermodynamics is quite robust, right? Even if you give much more power to the operations that we usually consider, we will still get the same answer. Like we we'll get we will get the free energy. Okay, so that will be uh, one insight that I think is, is useful here. Okay. So before that, let's look at the claim. And the claim, right, we saw before that uh, this relative entropy of rho to the maximum mixed state was a monotone in the case of, of uh, noisy operations, right? Um, here we, we have something kind of similar, which is that the free energy, the thermodynamical free energy, uh, is a monotone under thermal operations, okay? So if you apply from operations to a state, you can only uh, decrease the free energy, okay? And, and that's, a, that's a very good sign, right, that uh, this is the right direction, because if it wasn't, then there'll be something wrong, right? So if you had some class of operations that we try to model thermodynamics and it, it could increase the, the free energy, uh, this wouldn't make sense, right? And why that's the case? Well, that's because of, of effect, and that's the exercise from yesterday that I hope you try to solve today which is just a calculation, okay? So if knowing the definition of everything that you now know of the free energy, of the relative entropy, of the Gibbs state, you can just compute and you see it's true. We have that, this fact, temperature times relative entropy of rho in a max, in a thermal state of some Hamiltonian H. That's equal to the free energy with respect to this Hamiltonian of rho minus the free energy of the Gibbs state. Uh, so, try to show this, it's, it's easy. So that's nice, right? So uh, we saw before that in this toy mo model that we had, the relative entropy to the maximum mixed state was the right quantity. Here we're saying that the, the analog, which is now the relative entropy to the Gibbs state, is equal to a free energy, right? So, so this shows, right, that uh, there should be a connection between, um, between this, what we did before and what we get in standard thermodynamics. dynamics. Uh, free energy, okay. Right, so let me see how I am on time. I have half an hour. Um, yeah, so uh, Summerfield has a, has a, has a funny uh, quote on thermodynamics. Right, many people talk about thermodynamics, right? So like, I think he said, though, thermodynamics is, is the only theory that I'm sure will not be uh, overthrown by future theories, right? Uh, maybe, like, relativity, he's not sure, quantum mechanics, but thermodynamics, he, he said he was sure that would still exist in 300 years, because it's, it's a very robust theory. But this, I, I prefer, like, the, this Sommerfeld uh, quote, which is more suitable here. He said, okay, when the first time that we try to, uh, that you try to study thermodynamics, you don't understand it at all, right? Then you try it again the second time, and then you think you understand it apart from like a very small point, a few details. Then the third time, you are sure that you don't understand, but you don't care anymore because you're used to it. So I, maybe this is what you feel with respect to the lectures, right? The first lecture, I guess, you didn't understand much. Hopefully this lecture you ended with a good understanding of what I said, apart from a few points. That leaves the third lecture, that's a problem, but uh, <laughs> we'll discuss this next time. <laughs> Okay, so why, why this is, uh, this claim we just, this fact we just assume is true, but why is a monotone? Well, let's, it, it'll be very similar to what we did before, right? So let's just repeat to get used to, to the concepts. Uh, so first, several facts. 
Uh, one, if you have the relative entropy of rho and tau h, uh, and then this is like h system, right? That's equal to the relative entropy if we add any state to both sides, because relative entropy is additive in, in both arguments. So that's equal to the relative entropy if we add some Gibbs state, okay, with respect to some Hamiltonian hr on both sides. That's one thing. Second, uh, the relative entropy, it's invariant if you apply unitaries on both sides, okay, or to both arguments. So let's use that and let's apply a unitary that uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian, that preserves energy, right? Then we have the, the, the free energy of rho, sorry, the relative entropy of rho and tau hr with respect to tau uh, hs, tau hr, that's equal to the relative entropy that if you apply this, you know, this interaction, right, this unitary that commutes with the Hamiltonian. Right, that's a base effect of relative entropy. It's easy to, to, uh, to verify that if you apply unitary to both arguments, it doesn't change. But now, right, we know that uh, U commutes with HS plus HR. And what this means, right, we can diagonalize HS plus HR and U in the same basis. What this means is that uh, U preserves the Gibbs state, right? That's a total Gibbs state because we, we are not seeing interactions, right? So that's equal to the original one. So, uh, this is equal to what we want, right? To, to the to S U rho tau H R U dagger to the original one. Um, and finally, what we from operation, right? We can think that we just uh, we trace out the, the bath in the end, but then we have monotonicity that's always bigger than S of trace with respect to R of U rho tau hr uh, u dagger with respect to t, t, tau hs, okay? So this is some formal operations applied to rho, and we just saw it's a monotone, right? Uh, final result is that, uh, let's call this lambda, which is a form of operations. The s of rho tau hs, this is always bigger than s of lambda rho tau hs, okay? So it's a monotone, as we wanted. Um, so if it's a monotone, it's a good sign, so maybe it's a, you know, it's more fundamental quantity in the theory, maybe it's the rates in the theory, and of course you like that very much because we know that in standard thermodynamics the right quantity is the, is the free energy, so it would be nice if you get the same thing here, and this is what I want to tell you now, at least to give some idea how to get it. Um, so uh, this is a result, uh, uh, so it's, it's by myself with Michal Hordeski, uh, Oppenheim. Uh, Rennes, Joe Rennes and Rob Speckins. And it's from 2012. So what you can show is that rho and again, I use the same notation, now we are already used to it, right? When you have many copies with these thermal operations, so asymptotically, you can transform rho into sigma if and only if this relative entropy of rho with respect to HS, right? So this works like, you know, to specify the theory, we have to specify what HS is. It works for any HS. You specify it and then you have it. You specify HS and you specify the temperature, right? These are fixed. So maybe I should g write uh, given H, S, and T, the temperature. This is the case. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the only thing that we have to check, where this relative entropy is of, of the initial state is bigger than of the final state. And of course, right by, by this relation, this is the same thing as the, right, because relative entropy is basically just free energy up to some 
multiplying by temperature and adding some factor, which is independent of the states. So this is the same thing as the free energies, right, uh, being uh, monotonic. So as the free energy of rho being bigger or equal to the free energy of sigma. Okay. Um, and this is what we have in normal thermodynamics, right? So the free energy tells us when we can do the conversion, right? And, and it's the only thing that matters, right? So in the sense that uh, if, the free, if the free energies uh, of the output is smaller of, than of the inputs, in principle, you can always make the thermodynamic transformation. It might be very hard by being practical, but there is, you know, there is nothing preventing you from doing that. And this is what this result is saying, right? So what, one part of the result we already proved, right? This is what this monotonicity does. Because, uh, because this rate function, this uh, relative entropy, is a monotone with respect to thermal operations, if we can go from rho to sigma by thermal operations, we must have th that the relative entropy of rho is bigger than the relative entropy of sigma to the Gibbs state, right? So one direction is clear, it's easy to prove. What we want to understand is the other direction, right? Why only the free energy matters? Why, if the free energy of rho is bigger than the free energy of sigma, how we can construct a thermal, uh, a thermal operation, this thermodynamic process, that will map one state to the other, right? This is what we, that we, what we want to understand now. Okay. Um, so, okay, uh, something that we already saw yesterday is also true here, is that it shows that thermodynamics in, in this setting at least is reversible, right? Uh, in the sense that we can start from some copies of a state row. We apply from by firm operations. When we have many copies, we go to a given number of copies, a different number of copies potentially of the state sigma, but then we can go back to roughly the same number of copies of row. Uh, and, and what's M over N? Well, we know it's just the ratio of the relative entropies, right? Uh, sigma tau. Good. So now, uh, as, as we do like, as we did in entanglement theory, uh, a good way to prove that is just to choose uh, like a, a specific state and understand how we can first uh, create any other state starting from this like unit state and second how we can distill this unit state st uh, starting from some other arbitrary state. Like in entanglement theory, this was this maximum entangled state, right? This was like this EPR uh, pair, this this unit of entanglement. Here we have something similar, uh, but here the the concept will be like of uh, of a work bit, okay? So it will be like a work, the thermodynamic work, stored in, uh, in the simplest system possible, right? So, uh, which would be like a two-level system here. So to simplify this, uh, when I say the theorem, the system Hamiltonian could be anything, but because, you know, we, we only have like 20 minutes, I, I want to discuss the, the simplest case, which is still interesting, and this is when the system is just like a two-level system, and the Hamilton is the simplest possible. We just have some energy in the excited state, okay? So the Hilbert space of the system is just a qubit. We have the fundamental level, zero, no energy, and we have excited state with energy zero. Uh, and now what's this work bit? Well, this is just uh, a state in the excited state, okay? So it's a state which has zero entropy. We know it's in the excited state, and it has energy, right? Because it's excited state, so... Um, so it's like, you know, uh, this state, this state um, one, we will say that it's a, it's a bit of E0 of work. Right, so usually that's different from, also different from what we do in thermodynamics. Usually, right, usually work is like, you know, we're lifting this weight, right? Um, but here's everything in principle can be microscopic, right? We are not considering large systems here, at least uh, we, we consider large in the sense that we have many copies, but not raw can be like a quantum system. 
but still, this would be a way to define work as like uh, energy in this ordered way, right? We know that energy is in this well-specified state, which is the excited state. It's like energy with, without entropy, right? It's energy with zero entropy. Uh, and now to prove this result, right, that the free energy is the only thing that matters, we are going to consider two processes. One is what we can call work distillation. which is right, maybe what you usually do in thermodynamics, you have some system and you want to draw work out of it, right? Um, so this defines some rates. This is the rate of how much work you can get out of a state row, if you have many copies of the state row. Uh, and we define this as maximum over all M, such that we can go from row by thermal operations, but asymptotically, right, and, and remember, that there is a limit in uh, built in this notation, right? We're taking many copies of row and we are ma mapping to many copies of one of the output state. And what's the output state that we want is the maximum number of copies possible of, of one of this work bit, okay? Uh, so this is this function. We also will be interested in the reverse process. Uh, you can call the work cost of a, of a quantum state. And this will be Now we want to minimize over M, uh, integers M, such that we start with M copies of this you know, work bit one, and by this asymptotic from operations, we map it to one copy of row, okay? So it's like how much work we need to create copies of row. Uh, now, because for the same reason as for entanglement that we saw yesterday, the theorem that we stated is equivalent uh, to the work cost of a state row being equal to the, sorry, the distillable work of, uh, of a quantum state row being equal to the work cost of the state row and both being equal to the relative entropy of rho to the Gibbs state, right? Because if you have that, then we have this reversibility here that we saw here, this one, right? We just like, you know, if you want to convert rho into sigma, we convert rho into work, into the zero state, and we convert zero state into sigma. And we can do that reversibly with the right rate. So, so this is what we want to focus, right, on proving this, uh, these equivalences. Any question? Okay, um, so let's start with, uh, let's focus on work distillation. Uh, and the work cost would be similar. I, I, I will not tell you all the details. Work distillation. So what's the goal? The goal is right, to, to map the original state, many copies of the original state, so some copies, the maximum number of copies of this zero state. Sorry, not zero state, of the one state, right? The, one, yeah, the excited state. Uh, using thermal operations, right? So we have the quantum state row. We are considering the simplest case here, right, for in this lecture. So it's just a two-level system. And actually, I would just tell you argument in an even simpler case when rho is diagonal in the energy eigenbasis as well. And then you see that this is not a, not a restriction in the sense we can always, like, if we have many copies, we can reduce to this situation, but we'll do that later on. So we assume for now that the state is diagonal in the energy eigenbasis. The energy eigenbasis I'm writing as like zero and one, right? The excited state is one, the round state is zero. So the state is really just depends on a probability distribution P, on uh, P between zero and one. Uh, so we also have the, the, the thermal states and uh, the thermal state we assume also the simplest one possible will just be like we assume like a non-interacting bath, okay? So we have access to this non-interacting bath. Uh, this is not a restriction. You could consider other kinds of bath, as I said, but uh, also here to make this, to get to make it as simple as possible, let's do it. So we assume that the bath is many independent copies of, of a given Hamiltonian, which is a two-level uh, Hamiltonian. And actually, we assume that it's the same as the system, okay? So this will also be, for us here at least, the Hamiltonian of the reservoir. 
of one particle in the reservoir, and we have as many particles as we want in the reservoir. So what's the Gibbs state of one particle? Is this a state where, right, uh, Q, uh, you know, we have this both small weights, so Q is e to the minus e zero over t divided by one plus e to the minus e zero over t. Okay. So these are the two states that we have. Um, and what's the goal? What do we want to do? We want to map like uh, some number of copies of the Gibbs states tau, right? And we don't care about how many copies we use, as many as we need. Then we want to map uh, n copies of the like resource state n. And by firm operations, uh, we want to go to, uh, and of course, right, uh, approximately, right, we allow some small error that vanishes asymptotically. We want to go to uh, some, like, exhaust state, right? We don't care about what it is. It's like um, sigma k. But the useful one, which is work and the maximum number of copies possible. So we don't we don't care about what L is. L is as big as we, we need. We don't care about what sigma k is, is some arbitrary trash state that we throw away in the end. What we care about is to is to maximize M, right? We get we wanna we wanna make M as big as possible. Uh, so now um, okay, well actually let me be more precise, right? We are already put in the Gibbs state like uh, explicitly. So this transformation, we want to do it by some unitary U. But this unitary U now, it has to preserve energy, right? Uh, so U has to commute uh, with, the, with the Hamiltonian. Uh, well, and the Hamiltonian is the sum of this simple one, so let's just write in words. U uh, must preserve energy. And the sigma k, as I said, this is just this like exhaust state. Some trash that you have in the end. So what, what are the relevant rates here? One re relevant rate, which is what we want to optimize, maximize, is m over n, right? This is like the, the amount of work that we can get per copy of the resource states. And another parameter, which we don't really care, but will be useful to define, is the number of copies of the resource state per copies of the Gibbs state that we have, okay? And we see that this epsilon has to go to zero for, for the protocol to work, so we need like many more copies of the Gibbs states than copies of the resource state. Um, okay. Let me see how much time, maybe I have some. Right, so. The less we have, like ten minutes, so I'll give you, I'll give like half of the of the argument, and then ten minutes of less of the next lecture we finish, and then we we'll go to something else, to a different topic. But let me start it now. Uh, so we have all these copies of the Gibbs state, sorry, of, of the resource state of row, and the point will be to uh, to use something that we call like a method of types, which is you know, some something that we use in information theory a lot that will be useful to hear, which says that approximately, and you know, this the approximation gets as good as, as you want when you increase the number of copies. You can write this as a some average, some probability distribution p of t, and some states, uh, capital P of t, uh, such that uh, t is a bit string. It's over what we call typical types. Um, and typical in the sense that uh, the number of ones, number of ones in T is equal to N times P uh, and, s and some variance. Um, oops. Okay, it was too fast for for the surface. Uh, so maybe, yeah, we should go slower, right? So, um, yeah, it's, it's getting tired. Not, not only you are tired, but uh, <laughs> let's try again, maybe. Right, 
so let's go slower. Let's, before doing that, um, let's define, you know, what is this method of types, right? So we have, suppose, as we have here, we have like n bit strings. For example, 0, 1, 0, 0, blah, 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 1, 1. And you have n numbers. And the type of this string is simply uh, the number of ones in the string, okay? So very simple, right? You just count the number of ones, this is the type of the string. Now what I said before is that for any state, and this is, is like, uh, this is what you use in compression, for example, right? But uh, I will just, without proving, tell you what it is. You can write this as some sum of a probability distribution over types. T is, a, is like range over types and some states, uh, depending on the type T, such that, and this approximation gets better and better, such that T doesn't run over all possible types, but only over typical types. And what are they? They are, they are types for which uh, you have the expected number of ones, right? So we had this state and this state row, let me remind where it is, is with probability P it's one, with probability one minus P is zero. So if, if you, you know, if you draw a lot of, uh, of uh, samples from this, it's just a probability distribution, right? In, in the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian. If you draw a lot of samples from this probability distribution, we expect that when we do N samples and N is big enough, we should roughly see n times p once, right? And a typical type will be just a sequence of outcomes for which this is the case, okay? With, with the expected variance. So it will be t is over typical types, which are types for which, uh, for which t is roughly n p plus minus order square root of n, okay? So this is what we expect, right, from large deviation theory. That's this, you know, the weight of this probability distribution will be over these types, and you can prove that's the case. Another easy thing to see is that uh, how many types, how many different types are there, right? Uh, so, you know, we can have like all zero, then one ones, and two ones, and so on. Uh, so there is only, uh, the, uh, there is only n types, right? Um, so you have n different types. So this sum is not over a lot of terms, it's just over n different terms. Um, so now the idea would be to uh, concentrate on a particular type, okay? So we know that the state is over the typical types, which has roughly np, so we focus on one specific type and we, may, we see how to, make, how to draw work from it. And then you see how this mixture over types is not a big deal. And that will be the case because, you know, this entropy is over a very small set, right? So it's all, only over n, n different uh, states. So the entropy will be quite small and this won't be a problem for us. Um, so I'm running out of time. Um, maybe I just write what I said now and we stop. So what we will do, and this we'll do next time, uh, is that we will suppose First, that uh, gamma L, the n copies of the Gibbs state, and rho n, uh, they consist, uh, instead of like the superposition of a typical types, or this mixture of a typical types, to a single type. Uh, and what's the single type? No, what is this state associated to the type? This is just the, Uniform mixture uh, over strings uh, of length n plus l, right? n from row l from the Gibbs state, each composed of two substrings. Uh, the first substring, right, uh, with roughly uh, LQ ones, right? This is what we expect from the Gibbs states because the Gibbs state has a one with probability Q, right? And the second, which is from the resource states with roughly 
up to some square, you know, factors which are sublinear, n p are ones. Okay. Um, so we assume that we have this state, but it's just like uh, two maximum mixed states in a given subspace, namely in a subspace where you have l k ones and the other one where you have n p ones. Uh, so now one relevant information would be how many strings are there, right? With these constraints. In other words, what what's the entropy of this state once we fix the type? Um, so that's easy calculation, right? So how many we have in the first one is just L, are you, uh, L times K, right? So it's choose L, L, K, right? And we have to multiply this to N times NP. So, you know, these binomial numbers are bad, but this is roughly, because L and N are very big, this is roughly to a very good approximation, 2 to the L times HQ plus N times HP, okay? Uh, where this is the binary entropy. So uh, we will we, ref review this last, uh, next time, but I just wanna uh, get to the, where we have the constraints, where we see what how things will uh, we work. Um, so now what we want to do is um, how we're going to extract work, right? So what we want, what we want to do, we want uh, to map all these strings uh, into all the strings where, into strings having, having uh, at least M once uh, in the rightmost position, right? Why? Because then, right, we have all these ones in the rightmost position, and what we have in the rest, we don't care, and then we get close to where I wrote to this situation, right? This is our goal. We want to get like once, right, and we want to get this like uh, in some specific position, then the rest we trace out, we don't care. So this is what we like to do, right? But we have several constraints, and this is where energy will come in and everything, you know, everything will come together. So I, I write the three constraints, they are simple, and we stop here, and the next time we see how these constraints uh, leads us to the free energy. So wh what are the constraints that we can do in this transformation? Uh, so we have these bit strings, right? Like one, zero, one, blah, blah, one. This is the bit string of the, uh, of the thermal state. We have L bits here. Uh, and LQ once, then we have the resource, N copies, and it has NP once, uh, and we want to map this uh, to something arbitrary that we don't care, and this is this exhaust state which acts on K bits, and we, uh, we say that it has RK once, R is some number that we can choose, uh, but we want to have all ones, right? All ones here, and we want to have m ones. So this is what we want to do. And this process, it has to be by a unitary that preserves energy, right? So what, what are the constraints? So it's the last thing that I write. Sorry, I'm running over time, but just to finish on. Uh, so so now we have the right thing. So first is a unitary. So we have we have to preserve uh, dimension, right? So k has to be equal to L plus N minus M, right? So in other words, L plus N has to be equal to K plus M, right? We have to preserve dimension, the number of, of physical systems that we have. The several constraint, which is conservation of energy, the number of ones on the left-hand side has to be equal to the number of ones in the right-hand side, because this is the energy of the state. So L, Q plus N, P has to be equal to R, K plus M, right? So LQ is the number of ones in, in the Gibbs state, NP is the number of ones in the, in the resource state, RK is the number of ones in the, in the trash, in the exhaust states, and M is the number of works in, you know, how many bits of work we are drawing. And it has to be a unitary process, so we must have, uh, you know, we must conserve the entropy. So the, the final entropy, and the final entropy is just, uh, we assume that the exhaust state is some uniform uh, 
distribution, which is the maximum possible. So the number of bit strings is given by that, right? So it's exponential, or two actually, it's not E. It's K times the binary entropy of R, right? Because this is like, uh, this is like K, R, K, choose R, K. This has to be bigger than two to the L, H, Q. That's the number of strings uh, in the Gibbs states, in this guy, uh, times two to the N H P. Because this is the number of strings that we have on the resource state. So this is conservation of energy, this is conservation of dimension, and this is uh, conservation of entropy, if you want. This is the fact that we have a unitary. We have these free constraints. So it's just a matter of playing with this equation that we do next time, and we'll see that uh, the free energy emerges, okay? So the only way to make this transformation is that if you choose m equals to the ratio of free energies. Uh, so, and that's all. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? Fernando, can you do anything useful with the trash state? Like in the other case, in the infinite temperature, it's, you, you can use it for thermal compression and extract the information back out again in principle, can't you? Oh, so you, so you say it's a trash state at a given temperature and then you change the temperature. I don't, uh, I don't know. I mean, so, can, can, uh, can you recover the original state from the trash as you would in the NO case? Well, uh, you can, but only if you invest the right amount of work, right? Yes, because yeah. it's just a unitary, right? So you can do the reverse process, yes. So what you can show about this exhaust state is that because by the, you know, it has to be useless to extract more work from it, locally it has to be equal to the Gibbs state. So globally it doesn't have to be equal to many copies of the Gibbs state, but if you just look at it locally, it will be like Gibbs state. Um, but then if you, if you invest the energy back, you can recover. Then you, you recover, yes. Right, because you can just apply the, the unitary in the reverse direction. Um, and in, but in, in the sense of information compression, it, it has to be le is it less efficient than the infinite temperature case? Does it get more efficient as you get more higher temperature? You mean efficient in the terms in of the, how many copies of the Gibbs state you need? No, in, terms, yeah, in terms of the, the number of, of bits you're getting uh, of well, the, the number of energy, energy bits you're getting out. Oh, uh, in, like the work you're drawing out um, as a function of temperature. So, so this, uh, to understand that, you just have to see how the free energy varies with temperature, right? Uh, and this depends on the Hamiltonian. So it depends on the model. Yes. Okay. Uh, if this is thermodynamics, then all these numbers should be uh, very big in general, or is it just like uh, all this theory, given that uh, the specific test you want to do, you can apply it to small numbers or whatever? Yeah, this is what we want to do. We want to uh, we want to see whether like thermodynamics still works even when you have small systems. We didn't get there because at the moment uh, we have a very small system. Like rho is like a two-level system, can be an atom but you have many copies of it, right? So in the sense, we still have the thermodynamic uh, limits taking many copies of this microscopic system. But you see next time where, you know, if you try the same thing to just one copy of the states, uh, where we get something similar to thermodynamics, but the free energy won't be the right thing anymore. So we have like some generalization of the free energy. You have a whole family of free energies. So in a sense, when, once you go to the microscopic level, you still have something close to what we learn in thermodynamics, but it's more, we have more constraints, right? Because of course it must be harder to do the transformation. So you have like more second loss of thermodynamics, right? You have like more free energies that you have to satisfy. Okay. But at the moment, yeah, it's, still, it's, it's small systems but many copies of them. So that's why we expect to get still the, the, the normal answer, the free energy as the answer. Right? Any other question? So usually in the, okay, so usually in the usual, 
thermodynamics, we have an interpretation for the free energy as the energy that you can get out of the system under certain conditions or certain cycles that you... Yes. So can you do, can you uh, provide uh, an equivalent interpretation for the free energy in this case? Yes. So, you know, it's exactly what you said, right? Usually in thermodynamics, the free energy is how much work you can draw from the system by isothermal processes, right? This is the interpretation of the free energy. So here's something very simple, right? So the, the free energy will be how much work you can draw from the system uh, by thermal operations. But what's work here? Uh, it, it work is exactly uh, these states uh, of fixed energy and zero entropy. It's like the excited is is quantum states in the excited states. Uh, it's like the one state. It's what I call one state here. Where is it? Is this one? Is this thing here? Right. This work bits. Right. So this would be like you know this would be like lifting the weight right here you are, you are exciting uh, the energy level of an atom, but with no entropy right you know for sure that you have e zero of energy in that given quantum state. Mm. So this is the this is like the microscopic definition that we use of work, right? And and, and it, it relates to the other one in the sense that you have many copies of these work bits, uh, then you can use that energy to lift the weight, for example, right? You can use that energy perfectly to lift the weight. Because there is no entropy there, right? And then you, you convert this from some microscopic uh, energy stored there to some macroscopic energy, and then you can do whatever you want. But is is there a, a, a special relevance for computing, or is, so? I mean, so you can define all these things, yes. but uh, is it useful? What what does it bring to us in terms of uh, information processing, or so? Um, it's a good question. I don't want to claim much. So uh, the reason why I, I think it's relevant to study that is that it shows uh, it shows that in, in one sense that thermodynamics is is more robust than you know we could imagine in the sense that we we apply it to very different systems that the way it was originally developed and it still works. Uh, but also nowadays, and this I know much less, but people study you know people study like for example the smallest possible heat engines, right? So they want to extract work from smaller and smaller systems, and then they end up exactly in this kind of system that we're analyzing here, right? So just mm -hmm. atoms with a few levels and so on, and they want to understand what's the best way to, you know, to get work out of them, and and then this will be this and what we see next lecture, where you just have like a few copies of the states. This will be the relevant uh, theory, right, for such systems. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's right, yes. It's a good point, indeed. So, yeah, this is for non-equilibrium states as well. You can include equilibrium states here just by, maybe I'll mention next time, but you can always include in the, in the Hamiltonian a switch where, you know, if the switch is in the state zero, then you have one Hamiltonian. If the switch is in the state one, then you have a different Hamiltonian. And this, in this way, you can mimic equilibrium thermodynamics where you just change the Hamiltonian, right? But, but indeed, it's, it's more general, right? You, uh, you can have systems out of equilibrium, yes. More questions? Or? We thank the speaker again. Thank you.